All right, if you're ready to be inside of the word of the Lord, say, yes, I am. Yes, I am. And uh, if, if you love God, say yes. yes. If you know that he loves you, say yes. yes. Turn to someone seated by you and say, God loves you and I'm trying. The young couples did it. The old married couples just laughed. <laughs> I once heard a guy say the reason that he got married is because he was tired of making decisions. Man, <laughs> I'm not even looking to my right. No, it wasn't in my house. We would never say that, would we? Wouldn't we? Wouldn't. <laughs> I do need a ride home. Thank you, Kevin. Maybe I'll stay at your house overnight. Yeah, yeah, that'd be good. No, oh, my goodness. Hey, so let's go back to the script. Um, uh, the address is where we're going to be. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 to 16 today. One of my absolute favorite passages, and I was able to be discipled in, in these scriptures already uh, when I was a student in high school, and you know some of, of my testimony about how God placed people in my life to disciple me through all of those stages of development. Not only my parents who, although they were salespersons by profession, um, they are evangelists by heart. And everything they did always came about as an opportunity to make Jesus known. My dad was a fly fisherman and one, he's not one of those guys who just goes to the sport, sporting goods store and buys some stuff. Like he would make his own fly fishing rods tie all of his own flies. He doesn't swim, but he would be on a float tube in the middle of a lake to do fly fishing. Um, I mean, dedicated, right, all the way in. And uh, so he ran a fly fishing ministry for years and years and years. And the guys would go to the mountains, and they would go fishing, and they would hang out by the fire, and discipleship would happen because relationships were made. And at his funeral, when those men stood up and gave their testimony, my dad's name was Jerry, about how Jerry was the only one who ever accepted them as they were because they came from outside and they, they lived very differently than you and I. And, um, but they found love in that relationship. Uh, the other people in my life who also discipled me helped me understand what God was doing in my life. And I wanted to be a minister since I was four years old. I remember preaching to my stuffed animals. I had them lined up on the steps. They all got saved, by the way. They were stuffed with the word. <laughs> One was full of beans and rice, but you know. Um, I've always wanted to be a minister, and I believe that was a call, and God helped me understand that. And this journey, and this is week five of six in this uh, Spirit on Fire series, is about what God is doing in our life together as a congregation and in your life in particular, because you're on purpose Acts 17 says that he chooses when you live and where you live so that the people around you, your neighbors, will call on him and some of them might be saved. Acts 17, look it up. That's what this series is about, for you to discover God's purpose in your life. And 16-year-olds and 36-year-olds have the exact same question for their whole life. What in the world am I here for? This series will help us understand what that is. I want you to have some of the joy that I have in knowing that I'm using my gifts and pursuing God's purpose for my life living into his will so that the kingdom of God might come here on earth as it is in heaven. I want you to be a part of that. Here's what we've been looking at the past few weeks. We asked ourselves, where do spiritual gifts come from and what are they for? And we learned that they are from God to make his glory known. You, do I get to choose my gift? And the Michigan answer to that is, yeah, no, you don't. Uh, God bestows a gift on you like a trust. You don't own it. He does and he expects you to use it. Thirdly, how do I know my gift? Well, we learn it in community, where we rise up, how we interact with, act with life and people and all those things. Pretty soon, our natural abilities, those things that the Spirit created in us, have an opportunity to come to life, and they're developed in those places. And uh, how do I switch my gift on to the on position? How do I set it in motion? And we talked about those energies of um, once something is in motion, it will stay in motion unless friction removes it. So what does it look like to continue to energize our gifts so that they move in the direction that they're supposed to? And today we're going to be talking about this really wonderful, hard question. What does God expect of me? So let me be like a one-on-one -on -one with you for the next few moments and talk with you personally about what does God expect of you. He, has, he bestowed upon you. He gave you this gift uh, as a trust. Now what does he want you to do? 
about it? And how are we going to know if we're meeting those expectations? Um, I think before we get into the scripture, uh, I should tell you how I first understood this truth or precept. How do I know, um, or what does God expect of me, right? How do I know if I'm using that gift? Um, I've only ever seen two people fly in my whole life. Superman, you've all seen the movie. The other one, his name, Michael Jordan. Maybe you know him? Yeah. Um, well, there's that one, kid, that one kid in third grade. Remember, we used to swing on the big swings in the, in the playground, and you'd have your shoe loose, and when you'd get to that, the top of the forward swing, you'd flick your foot, and your shoe would go flying. One kid, he went flying with his shoe, and so three people I've seen fly. The truth is, though, we used to live in Chicago. We moved here from Chicago about 30 years ago. We lived in the Burbs. And uh, it was during the Jordan era Bulls when they were on top of the world. Remember that? I remember when Dennis Rodman joined that franchise. It was in 1996 after we had already moved here. Um, and I wasn't a fan. Uh, what I knew of him and saw of him, he seemed rude and arrogant and even a little bit wild, and maybe he was. But Michael Jordan knew something about Dennis that we didn't know, that I didn't know, right? Michael talked Phil Jackson into hiring Dennis uh, because he could bring something to the team that Michael himself couldn't even do it. Michael's average over his season, uh, his career, there was 31 and a half points per game, 6.3 rebounds, and 5.4 assists, but he needed Dennis to be able to do that. Dennis averaged only five points a game <laughs> in 199 games, five points. 15.3 rebounds, however, was his average. He won three rebounding titles, and with Michael, they won three national titles in a row, 96, 97, and 98. When the other players told Phil Jackson, don't hire him, he's off the leash, don't put Dennis on our team, there's going to be a toxic thing happening here, Michael talked him into it because he knew they needed a player who was different than him on the team so that his gifts and his together would excel. Dennis couldn't shoot to save his life. His free throw averages were only 50%. But no one could rebound like him. No one could frustrate the other team like him. He knew how to get under their skin. Remember that one, uh, the one game, there was, uh, the other team was shooting free throws, and you have to all, you're supposed to all stand in a line around that box, and the guy shoots a free throw. He just stood like this and looked at that guy square in his face. That was his blessing to the team. He made the other ones off their game. Maybe it's an old story, but the point is enduring. When we are built to play a particular role and someone notices that we're built to play that role and then puts us in the, the position that we're gifted to do, we can excel in that role on our team and put a W in the books. Maybe that's a little bit like us. No one ever expected Dennis to make a shot or make a free throw or score points. That's not what he was on the team for. He was there to pull down rebounds and get control of the ball for his team. And even though we're not like Dennis, I'm thankful for that. What I mean is that you and I are designed for a role. And when that design is made known and developed and put into place and given the opportunity to work and we do it for God in his strength, there will be teamwork like we've never experienced before. Those around us will excel our team will be better than we can imagine when each of us lives out our gifts in the particular role we're designed for. Different roles, one team. When skills are noted by other people and put into action, we win. I think that's the greatest way to understand Ephesians 4. Because when you rock in your role, we all rock. Let's ask God's blessing, then we'll jump into Ephesians 4.11. Father God, for whatever you're going to teach us today, I pray that uh, my words will be a conveyor and I'll be a conduit for truth. Help us to understand your word, uh, for all theology is practical. Just as you saved Israel and you saved us and you removed us from um, our slavery to sin, I pray, Lord, now that you will use us by the power of your spirit that resides in us to bring life to others. Help us, Lord, in this season, for these years or decades, whatever it is as part of a life, to be that place where it is safe to know you, where we can understand who we are and our salvation in you, Jesus. So bless us now in this time of learning from your word that we may all be hearers and doers. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I'll ask you one more time. You ready to be in the word? Say yes. yes. Ephesians 4, verse 11. Notice the first three words. So Christ himself 
It has to start there. We have to know. We've been talking about this for four or five weeks already. He's the source. These are his gifts. It's his design, his purpose, his church. Scripture says that we are the body. He is the head of the body, right? This is all about him. He's the source. He's the organizer. He's the equipper. He's the team role designer. He puts us in our places. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers. And why did he do that? To equip his people for works of service, to put them in the right position and then develop them. So I played um, three sports when I was in high school. Well, one was cross country. I only did that one year, just the first year. Um, that was just a lot of work. I gave that up. In fact, one time, uh, so our coach was a marathon runner, like Boston Marathon kind of guy. And so one day he took us 10 miles from school and then we had to run back. Not in a circle, 10 miles from school and we had to run back. We happen to know the bus driver who was taking the kids out that way, and we thumbed a ride home. Practice the next day was the worst ever in my whole life. So I only did cross country one year, but I played, I played uh, baseball and basketball. And in baseball, I started out as a pitcher. Uh, I can throw like crazy, uh, like 100 miles an hour kind of stuff. I just can't hit the catcher's glove to save my life or the life of the batter. Um, <laughs> So they said, all right, what do you do with a guy with an arm that can throw like crazy? And they put me in outfield. And I ended up in left field for my high school career and uh, could throw guys out all the way from the fence. Uh, when, you, when your gifts are realized and you put in the right position, your team, team gets a W. Make sense? So God provides leadership for the church to equip us for works of service. And what happens when you're in the right role, what you're designed for? Here's what the word says, Ephesians 4, 12b so that the body of Christ may be built up. The body of Christ does better. It gets stronger, more mature, better at what it does, may be built up in these things. Verse 13, until we all reach unity in the faith and unity in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. And then Paul describes that. He writes his own commentary. Uh, attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. That's the simple math of this verse. As God designs and places us in the right place, the body excels and it matures and becomes full of Jesus. And here are the, revo the results, verse 14. Number one, we're no longer immature. Then we'll no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching, and the cunning and the craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Hang on just a second. I'm sorry, I have to pause. My computer's trying to update. <laughs> uh, hang on just a second. Here we go. Uh, do not disturb. Uh, give me a second here. This is crazy. All right. For an hour. We got an hour? <laughs> do not disturb for an hour. Let's try it. See how it goes. All right. <laughs> Here's the results. We'll no longer be... So I'm just totally distracted now. Anybody else with ADD? <laughs> here we go. Uh, maybe we should do halftime again. Uh, hang on. Shake it off. <laughs> Uh, now I got Taylor Swift on my, I don't know. Oh, man. That's how it is, right? Rabbit, squirrel, you know. Uh, then we'll no longer be infantile preachers and tell stupid dad jokes. Um, then we'll no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Infants, you know what they're like. They're, they're completely subject to others. They can't feed themselves, transport themselves. They can't stand, they can't talk. They, they only respond and they react. And, and then verse 15 says, but there's a whole nother way. Verse 15, we're not immature instead. And remember, we talked about this word. It's a, I think it's ayah, but the word is but, or rather, or on the other hand, something completely different. We don't have to stay infants. We can grow up. Number two, verse 15, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow. We will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head. That is Christ. So we grow up in truth to be like Jesus. Note the flow or the hierarchy. We're not the head. We're the body. We follow his lead and his direction. Verse 16, from him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament. Now, here's some cool language that helps us understand our role as a part of the body to fully cooperate and be engaged. From him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up. That's not passive language. 
means we have to be engaged, that we follow his lead, but we do, we fulfill that role, builds itself up as each part does its work, as we do our work, motivated and demonstrated in love. While we work, we grow. You got to hit the weights. You got to get in the weight room if you want to grow up and be strong. It is work. We each have a particular work ordained for us, and we're designed to do that role. In fact, if we were to draw these words backwards, and I'm a whiteboard kind of a guy, if we were to draw these verses backwards, right, the body builds itself up and gets stronger when it follows the leadership of the head of the body. The head, Jesus Christ, the body, the church, with increasing detail over time, stronger and more dynamic and rich and full, no longer a little stick man, no longer just a pencil drawing. It's a full 4K, dynamic, rich, and deep and colorful picture of a grown person. Here's how Ephesians 4 actually looks if you're taking notes. Number one, Christ, who is the source. We talked about that. Christ provides leadership and direction and resources for the church to grow. The groom takes care of the bride. Can I get an amen? He gives us everything that we need. He gives teachers and leaders who equip us according to his design. And while we do our work, we become unified in faith and knowledge. The scripture says we become mature. We become filled with a fullness of Christ. And isn't that our ultimate goal? Christ-likeness in all things. So Christ is the source and he provides leadership. And the next one, the marks of the fullness of Christ become more evident as we mature. The, the more mature we are in Christ, the more obvious Christ is in us. We start to look more and more like our family. The traits and the character become more obvious in us. A child can be more easily tricked than fooled. I mean, even if you go like this and say, peek, <laughs> they think that you're not there for a second right? Um, it's not that way when we grow up. The mature one is not blinded by new things or distracted by bright and shiny things or every time some new teaching comes along, they go, oh wow, that must be the new thing. And, and spiritual ADD is a big deal, right? The spiritual infant will follow anything. The spiritually mature follow Christ. We speak the truth in love. We follow Jesus in, enjoy, in joyful obedience. We studied that word last week. The deacon, the one who raises the dust, is in a hurry to serve others. We're in a hurry to obey. And while we do those things, we experience growth as we love each other in community, fulfilling our roles in that community. We make each other better. That's what maturity looks like. So I was thinking about that. So how's a live doing? If we were to have some sort of a, a, a litmus test, you know, if we were to be able, so I have a swimming pool, it's a dough, a dough boy in the backyard, and every week I have to test the chemicals and see if the pH is right and the alkalinity and, and the chlorine levels and all that kind of stuff. And I wondered, what, what would a live look like if we had a litmus test? Let's ask some things here. I wondered about our leadership. Do we have good leadership equipping us in matters of faith and knowledge and service? I think we do. Is our faith and belief stable? Like, are we confident in the word of God? Are we able to use it wisely? Thirdly, do we speak truth? Next, do we love others as we've been loved by Christ? Are we growing more mature, more obvious evidence of the godliness in our lives? And are we using our gifts? Like, do I know my gift and am I using it, fulfilling my role in this body? I think we can say yes to a lot of this. And if we can say yes to these and work hard on the ones that we're not quite sure about, imagine how God will be glorified in this church. We'll look like Jesus to him when he sees us. And the world will see Jesus in you. And God will draw his people to himself, helping them belong in a healthy body where they will be nurtured to become mature into the fullness of Christ. They'll grow their faith. They'll grow their knowledge and understanding. They'll grow their understanding of their role in the kingdom and how they will serve others in love. As a life gets healthy and becomes an authentic community, God will grow it by bringing his people to himself. Really, this is simply the list of evidences of what some would call the Spirit-led church. A church that is Holy Spirit-led, which is what we want to be, it's what we need to be, looks like these three things. A Spirit-led church boldly uses their spiritual gifts. 
Kay Arthur in her book says, if, if they're not, then it's not a real church. The church not built on spiritual gifts is truly a contradiction because then it's not full of the Holy Spirit. The church is a gifted church, she says, or it's not one at all. A spirit-led church is authentic and has holy relationships experienced in the demonstration of those gifts in service. That's how growth happens. The second thing, a spirit-led church is full of Christ. Every dynamic is because of him. Every dynamic leans into what his spirit does in that place to strengthen us, to, to lead us, to equip us, to renew us. A church grows mature when Christ is pervasive, filling every aspect, every corner, every goal, every strategy, every ministry, every gathering, every purpose and mission has to be about Jesus. Our gifts and how we use them must be for his purpose. Our growth and maturity are directly related to how we access the Holy Spirit in us. Fulfilling our potential causes others to grow. Submitting to leadership helps others follow Jesus too. All this is a demonstration of authenticity and dignity and trust, which are the three primary things for good relationship. You see, as we trust God and what God is doing in our lives, then we can trust God in what he's doing in the life of someone else. When we're full of Jesus, we reflect his image, his beauty, and we become more attractive. Evangelism and witness is stronger and more effective when Jesus leads it. Amen? We're not calling people to become like us. You don't need another bad dad joke pastor. <laughs> we all need to become like Jesus. And thirdly, a spirit-led church is humble. A humble church is ready to empty themselves for the sake of another. In a healthy, Christ-centered, spirit-led congregation, members are mutually independent. Remember where we started weeks ago? We talked about that where you have to lean in when the saw is pulled and then you pull back and that's how we get our work done. We're mutually interdependent. We use our roles to serve others and we allow them to serve us in their roles, relating and serving in ways that were designed. And it all starts with humility because here's the truth. We need each other. God designed us to function as a team. I need you, you need me. We must respect each other. If God designed those roles, then I should respect that role. And we must sympathize with each other. That is, when you rejoice, I should rejoice with you and multiply that. And when you are heavy burdened, I should help you lift it to reduce that load for you. But when we ignore our gifts, the opposite of growth and maturity happens. We become like an infant and childish, right? Members become consumers and are uninvolved. Those who do serve are overworked. People end up not being served and no one is satisfied. Conversion growth becomes slow and even absent in a church that's not spirit-led. And soon program needs to take the place of people and then the program withers on the vine because there are no people. But when we use our gifts, the sentence actually says when we know and use our gifts, and I think many of us know our gifts. If, if you don't, uh, we'll present to you opportunities shortly to be able to do that. Um, but we have to use them. When we use them and, and, and how they work and fit together and they complement each other, then all of a sudden we feel better about our ministry assignments because we're serving in spirit strength. There's more togetherness and we experience belonging and our teams increase and function more efficiently with Holy Spirit power and effectiveness. This isn't just some seminar on how to succeed at ministry. This is not a teaching on how to have a cool church plant. It is not that at all. This is a series. What these passages, passages are about is that when we do life and church God's way, there is biblical growth. Remember the descriptors. We'll have unity, and we have a lot of that already. We'll have maturity, and we see that growing all the time. I see a desperation in some of you a desperation to seek God's face, a desperation to do life his way. I get emails and phone calls every week. Pastor Terry, I, I've, I've discerned my spiritual gift through a, a survey or whatever, and I want to know how to use that. That, to me, is a demonstration of hunger. I've been on the phone with people who say, I know the will of God, and I want to pursue that. Please help me to move away from those, thin, those things in my life that are keeping me down. I see love and, and empathy and helpfulness 
And, and the building blocks of belonging, those are here. And when we enact them and do those things, imagine that community. Because alive is not a manufactured goodness. And I have the first three letters, M-A-N. Alive is not a manufactured goodness. The joy that you experience here is because of Christ in you. You are beautiful because of Christ in you. He's here. And that's why we prayed earlier. We're actually on holy and sacred ground. It's like at a wedding, you know, right at the beginning when everyone's in their place, and then that pure white runner is rolled out, and it's like we're the bride walking down that center aisle to see the bridegroom, and the minister is about to ask the bride if she will take the groom to be her husband, to rely on his providence, to trust his strength, to take his arm of leadership, to trust him and experience his love and faithfulness and providence no matter what. And the word of God to us as a minister of truth says, do you take this man, Jesus Christ, the son of God, the lamb of God, to be your groom? And we say, yes, I do. Yes, I do. I will. Yes, I will. Everything, all of it, our whole lives permeated and saturated into the fullness of Christ. That's what using our gifts is about. That's what following the leadership of, Holy, of the Holy Spirit in us is about. When we humbly accept and humbly surrender to his will and how he designed us and equipped us and called us and then actually do it, we become an increasingly beautiful bride, learning more. Uniting in our faith more, understanding more of the truth, understanding how he loved us as we love others. And as we know forgiveness, then we can forgive. You see, that's why he died for us. That's why he gave us his Holy Spirit. And that's why he's coming back. I just have two sentences to wrap it up and then we'll be done. It's the question we started with. What does God expect of us? And how will we know if we're actually living according to his will for us? It's when we look and act like Jesus. When that fullness, as it fills up, and we become more mature, more willing, more equipped, and more effective, humbly following the Holy Spirit as we are equipped, actually living out our roles, that's how we'll know. And some of us, well, we'll average 31.5 points per game. Some of us will haul down rebounds like no one else, and together we'll make a team. In the power of the Holy Spirit, there is a team, and that team gets a W. Let's pray together. Father God, we, um, we want to humble ourselves in this place and respond and obey your word for lord jesus you are the author and perfecter of faith you are the giver of the spirit you are the one who is uh, the one who catalyzes our gifts and uh, sets us into place to use them and surrounds us with a community uh, that we can serve and so i pray lord that together um, as a church in jenison we will serve our community well and together in our small groups we will learn to serve each other well and so I thank you, Father, for calling us to be together for this time in this place. And so today in humility, we pray your name, Jesus, over everything, over all of our decisions, over all of our groups, over all of our leadership and all of our relationships, over every marriage, over every school and teacher, over every child. And we surrender uh, ourselves, Lord, that you would be the king of all things. We pray for your help and your covering and leadership in our pain or depression, our diseases and our doubts, even our anxieties and our questions. Father, bless this church with leadership, especially now during nomination season. Father, may those things come alive. May, may your Christ-likeness, Lord Jesus, may it be evident in others so that we can um, place them in the, in the roles that you've designed for them. We pray for those who are, are seeking uh, an opportunity to give their testimony and make profession of faith. Lord, that you would rise up in them a holy desire and a passion to know you more and to speak your name. Father, we pray for kids alive who are in session right now that you would bless all their teachers and each of them and their families, Father, to know you and love you and serve you always. We pray for uh, all the new small groups that we have this season and help them all to be able to connect and serve well and to help each other grow, to support each other with prayer and in all the practical ways. 
We thank you, Father, for our vision team and for our council as they meet this week. Father, I pray a blessing upon them for all the leadership gifts that they need to serve well, to connect people not only to each other, but to you, Lord Jesus. May they have wisdom and capacity. May they be able to speak truth and to love. May we bring help and resource as it's needed. Father, you've designed your church as your gospel team around the world. You've designed our roles on that team. So give us leaders to equip us and help all of us to do our part, to take up our role and follow you, Jesus. In the power of your Holy Spirit, help us to bring life to our communities. And in the power of your name we pray, amen.